Hello, welcome to the meeting tent. My name is Bill Haber. Uh, once again, we're here to talk about the work of Stan Tenen. Uh, before we get started, let me introduce our usual cast of characters, Lamont Tenen, Michael Andron, and Adele Packer. Unfortunately, uh, Daniel Gill couldn't uh, join us today. So some, today we're gonna do something interesting and fun. Uh, and let me uh, give some background. Uh, as we've talked about many times, or this is the first time you've uh, watched anything having to do with this, uh, during the period of 1989 and 1999, uh, we videotaped a series of lectures by Stan. And they're all available on our website, meruvideo.com. Um, and I should give you the titles because that's kind of related. Uh, the first one was called Geometric Metaphors of Life. Uh, that was done in 1989. That was done in San Francisco. And then the next one was A Matrix of Meaning for Sacred Alphabets. At that point, Stan had, uh, the first one he hadn't developed or even discovered that the hand model, uh, but by Matrix of Meaning he had. Um, and that was done in Berkeley. Uh, at Arthur Young's Institute of the Study for Consciousness. In 1992, he did a lecture called The Alphabet in Our Hand. In 1994, Alphabet in Our Hands, Part Two. That's the titles we gave them at the time, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then in 1999, um, he came back to San Francisco, they, uh, Lavana and Stan were living in Sharon at that point and did one that we called uh, Squaring the Circle. So I shot them and edited them. Uh, and then at some point I decided, well, let's take little clips from all these presentations, gave each one a title. It was Stan's idea to call it Extreme Kabbalah. And that is now at a website called ex extremekabbalah.com. These clips are uh, two to three minutes at the most. And so I've asked our panel uh, to choose uh, a few of these. Let me go ahead and, and put this on the screen so you folks can see what it looks like. So this is um, the site, Extreme Kabbalah. Oh, I thought it was .com, so maybe it's .org. We'll have to double check that. Oh, that's weird. Uh, needless to say, we haven't really looked at the site for quite a while. Um, and uh, But there has been, people have been viewing these. Uh, these are all links to uh, the videos that are on YouTube. And so as you can see, there's, um, I think there's a total of 33 topics here. So I invite folks to go to this site uh, and you can go through all of these, uh, and then it might spur you to go to the actual video that it's uh, that it it comes from. And again, those are all available on meruvideo.com. So I've asked our panel to choose uh, topics, and uh, we'll watch a video and then discuss it. Now, Lavana will kind of guide us through some of these in terms of some of this the discussion was superseded or Stan just moved away from the topic he was discussing because it just wasn't going anywhere. But we'll see. We'll see where it goes. So let's start with you, Lavana. Which, um, which one of these would you like to start with? Well, um, if, it, if the clips match the title... Um, I think a good one to start with is the one called Framing Meru Research. Okay. Uh, framing in the sense of placing it in context. Okay, so let's take a look at that.
This is very controversial material because, um, in the words of a friendly scholar, it can't be so. Um, and what, of course, he means is that if it is so, then there's a lot of readjustment to make. Um, and I try to explain to people that this really doesn't say anything like, I'm right, you're all wrong. Um, it says, rather, that this is a deeper level that integrates a whole range of material. And it demonstrates mostly that what the scholars have been saying and what the religious people have been saying um, and what the different religious people have been saying, they've all been right, but in their own contexts. And that if you go deeper, then you find something more common. So that, you know, I think that was important to point out uh, in terms of the fact that, you know, he wasn't saying what I've got is this great discovery and it's, you know, supersedes everything else out there. And that it, that it was very inclusive. Is that, it, would that be correct, Levana? Um, inclusive is not quite the right word, even though it's an a, a, a popular word. What it was, was the word that Stanley used, deeper. Um, he had, as I think I've mentioned in others of these videos, a real talent for and a skill that he developed for perceiving underlying processes to focuses and pursuits that on the surface seemed quite different. But you know, if you look at a lot of his graphics, for example, you'll see examples pulled from many different fields. And he finds a common thread in terms of how they actually work, how they go from one step to another to another, uh, similar to the kind of deep perception of how things work that he originally found discussed in the work of Arthur Young, which we talked about, I think, last week. Um, and so what he was trying to say in that very short little clip was that what he is presenting um, looks at the deep commonalities that one finds in, for example, I'll get specific, various different um, streams of spiritual practice, not saying that they are the same, not saying that it's, you know, one is the equivalent to the other, rather saying that ultimately they're all looking at the same, the same process, looking in the same direction. Um, and I think he got um, more specific and clear about that in the following decades that what's happening is that that um, all of these different processes and fields and ways of looking at our reality the deeper you go the clearer it is that that they're looking in the same ultimate direction um, this particular clip came from the 1999 video um, where which is where you'll start to see more more of an explanation of the way in which this work can be seen to be universal um, making a very clear distinction between the idea of everything sort of blending which is not what he was saying rather that as I say um, that these things either evolve in analogous ways um, and or uh, point in the same direction, you know, depending on what he was talking about. Right. And I know that uh, this clip was also on uh, the first verse, the 30 minute introductory video. And he went on to say, and maybe it's uh, also one of these clips uh, that, you know, I'm not saying that all religions are the same, that each has its purpose. Um, and that got into the, the, the idea of the tree of Abraham having uh, each um, element had a, a specific role or, but they were, there was a relationship, but they all had a specific. Um, yeah, that the, the, the three, taking the example of the three Abrahamic religions, right. um, that they were each a part of a particular process of uh, development of right. life, of 
you know. Um, and, a life cycle, right? Yeah, yeah. He compared it to the yeah. tree, he called it the tree of Abraham. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, Michael, what is your uh, what is your choice here? Let me go back to um, share screen. Um, how about all letters from Yud? There are two teachings about the source of the alphabet. One of them is that the letters come from fire or flame. In the other, in Hebrew, is that these letter shapes, and these are the formal shapes, all of them are made up of the letter Yud, this small little letter. They're all composed of little pieces of Yud. That's a nice teaching. And it's obviously true in terms of calligraphy. But Yud also means hand. And the one thing that every human being can automatically do survival necessity is visualize their own hand. And so if you put the hand in your hand and feel it against your skin, you can immediately visualize the letters. And how is it forgotten that the letters came from a hand? They wrote it down. It says it comes from Yud. Except people thought it meant small Yud instead of the hand. Michael, uh, you've talked about it. Uh, the fact that it's the tenth letter and that, you know, it's all letters uh, emanate from the letter Yud. Um, well, Yud, Yud, is a, Yud is a very unique letter. It's the only letter in the alphabet that hangs freely above the line. Every other letter goes down to the line or some of them go down below the line, but there's only one that floats. And because it's 10, um, they even talk about God having not a four letter name, but a five letter name. And that is each one is one of the worlds in Jewish mysticism. And the coat so show you the little tiny crown, the little tiny antenna that comes out of the letter Yud when it's written in the Torah. <clears throat> um, that is what and I'm sorry Dan's not here because he's the our expert on Shefa Tal, uh, which we talked about I think last week. That that is an influx of dew. It's like a drop of dew coming down into the world that somehow from outside of it all comes that one drop that that is pure and represents the ten, the number of yud, the ten spherot the 10 forces that God built the world with. So when we say that the Torah came from that, God looked into the Torah, is how it's expressed, and created the world. And it would be the letter Yud that represents the 10 Sfirot, that were like his 10 fingers, as it were, to bring that light into the world, into our world, which is not pure oneness but is differentiated it's all the different uh and made even more complex uh, once we hit the tower of babel and everybody started speaking their own language and i think that that's also it occurs to me it occurred to me as i was listening to to levana just now that it's it's not yes it is it's a question of another way of looking at the same thing but we need those because, for example, a scientist who considers himself all analytical and left brain, he's not going to read some kind of beautiful mysticism and immediately resonate with it. He won't, he'll just toss it aside. Mm -hmm. But if he has a geometric shape or a formula or something that relates to him, whereas the mystic will look at all the geometry and say, I don't know what you're talking about. This is, you know, pure love and light and so on. Each one, each language after the Tower of Babel all came back. But the ultimate spark that started it all was that letter Yud. And so, so Michael, for those who are not familiar with the Hebrew alphabet, if you look at the letters, you will see a Yud contained in each of the letters physically or visually well you could yeah in a sense I mean, the first letter of the alphabet an aleph is made up of a line and a yud 
and a Yud. And the mystics teach that that was creation. When God said, let there be light and created this world in which we live, or and when I go world, I don't mean earth. I mean anything that exists outside of God's oneness. There was a Yud above the firmament, and there was a Yud below with a line separating them, but also joining them. Mm -hmm. So it would be like the yin and yang, the same same kind of image that the letter Aleph, which began it all out there, then began to with the letter bet and the little crown or the dot in the middle of the bet, depending on which way you look at it. That's where this differentiation happened. That's where multiplicity started. Mm -hmm. And so yes. that Yud came down below the firmament Outside of the firmament is just God, and not, not just God, but <laughs> there's nothing but. It's pure unity, which is impossible to comprehend. Right. Because if we're sitting and trying to comprehend it, that makes two of us. That makes God and us <laughs> trying to think about it. So it doesn't work. Our mind can't fathom it. We As can only the fathom it. it from the bet on. Yeah, that's right. And that dot, therefore, especially with the hand model, it seems that no matter what it was, if you look at any part of the hand model, it's going from sort of a circle into a line. And the pinpoint of that line, if that were the starting point, it comes down into a into an olive, a bed, or into a bed, the gimel, a dawad, and so on. And it all began with that pure unity, aleph, the first word of the word, echad, in the Shema. It's, that is the first yud, that's the transcendent yud and then there's the imminent uh, not like imminent soon but imminent with an a like remaining inside it, it's the one that exists within our universe mm -hmm. and that's the yud that's down here mm -hmm. that's imminent so, yeah. as opposed to transcendent that's the yes yeah 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 that, that, the that's trouble the is it possible. sounds like imminent like it's coming soon it's imminent but it's I M M A um, to be within. Mm -hmm. So there's one surrounding, there's God surrounding, and there's God filling. Mm -hmm. And that's how they differentiate between the Holy One, blessed be He, is outside, and the Shekhinah, where God resides, where we can contemplate it a little bit, mm -hmm. is the imminent, is the one that's uh, in our in our universe. Okay. The idea uh, of also the um, of the bet as being where we can start to exist, understand things, whatever. Um, right. For those of you who are more slightly more mathematically inclined, or who have seen a few of Stan's lectures, um, that is, or who have read the book, that is exactly in the same sense as. He is identifying the letter Beck with what uh, Spencer Brown called the first distinction, which is a mark in an otherwise uh, amorphous reality, a, a non-signified reality. You uh, basically, if you make one mark, then you are making a distinction, and that is the beginning of formal logic for Spencer Brown. Um, and that is, uh, you know, again, for people who are so inclined, you can find that dealt with somewhat in our book in some of the sections on the letter bait, which is um, very important, you know, in the kind of mental lo logical structure of our work. And there are, it, it, particularly in that first video that we talked about, the squaring the circle, um, if you watch, if you have the time to watch that two-hour lecture, you'll see a whole lot more about the letter bait and its being where we, where where we as humans can start. Um, so yeah, um, Michael, I, I you know I um, agree. I, there's another there's another simple way of seeing it. The yud above mm -hmm. is like a white light, a spark of light. Okay, and the beginning of the bet, the beginning of that universal distinction world is a prism. And when the light comes through, now we have not seven colors, but 10. 
So out there is one light, mm -hmm. but it's white light. Think of it that way. And inside is the rainbow. Mm -hmm. All the differences, all the uh, divisions among nations and languages and people and everything that creates all the <sighs> challenges for Earth at this time with all its distinctions. Um, and unfortunately, we're not at the point where we see the whole thing, where we see that it's all coming from one and but what we see are the differences mm -hmm. so even though our dna is virtually the same uh male female white black red brown yellow all of those things are minute in terms of the dna but enough to get people to hate somebody who's not like them i wanted to get uh give Adele oh, uh, an opportunity to weigh in if you could unmute um yeah so um I see this relationship between the bet and the yud, that the bet is this first distinction, this process of, the, you know, we're at the, we're bridging close to Rosh Hashanah, and it's like that, that beginning, beginning again, and, and that place of excitement right before something really changes. And from this unity of Aleph, there was a change where there was a distinction. When I learned calligraphy, you started with a yud, and you drew the line down, and it became a nun. I mean, above, and you drew the line across, and it became a nun. So every letter depended on your ability to create this little swirl of a yud, and so the many of the mystical creation stories are about that yud, that yud that is that spark or the spark within us. This. Um, it's a starting point, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's a distinct, you just put your pen on the paper and make a point and something has changed. So the mystical connection between the Bet and the Yud is, is so profound, but the Yud brings it into our hand because mm -hmm. it's a Yod, it's a hand. And it's and interesting, think, yeah, it's interesting at the very end of that clip Stan's not saying that the letters come from the letter Yud. He's saying the letters come from the hand as represented by the letter Yud. He says, there it is. That's what they said. The letters come from the hand. So it's an interesting distinction. Uh, Lavana, you had another? Yeah, just to, to, to build a little bit on what Adele said, that um, if you, you know, if you like really pour through our materials, you'll find that, um, that Stan also had the idea of the Yud as representing will. The association with the hand, the hand is generically the expression of our will. We think we're going to do something and we reach out and do it with our hands. Um, and that is an interesting, I have found just in my own study and reading, an interesting idea to keep in mind when I'm reading you know, uh, discussions of the Yud and its meaning to also sort of give it that, to give it that shade of meaning that it is active will. It's, uh, well, okay. The, I think somebody I, I've could said write all, a, I've said all that I can on that. I think now. somebody could write a book on just a letter Yud. But then again, you could probably write a letter have. on all the, all the letters. Yes. Probably. <laughs> okay, Adele, it's your turn. Yeah, I just want to, Oh, I'll say one sure. more thing because this yud is so remarkable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This whole idea of inside and outside mm -hmm. yeah. that yud can be complete presence. It's self referral in the gesture of yud. Mm -hmm. It's like when I do yud, it, it comes right into like, who am I? Where am mm -hmm. I? Here I am. This is who I am. Mm -hmm. So yud has that inner quality, but it's also a hand that expresses what's coming from the inside out this will to mm -hmm. act mm -hmm. on a thought what is, a, so, what is the gesture for you it's so it i'll do it to the side so you, mm -hmm. it's kind of like me that's mine yeah mm -hmm. me i agree you know mm -hmm. those are the kinds of uh just thoughts one might use when we do a gesture like that mm -hmm. and yod is just so simple right it's just like its shape its smallness it's a small, simple gesture that just 
I'll it tell you a story me, about yeah. about that, which is that originally, um, when Stanley was exploring the gestures, what gestures would be appropriate for different letters, and you know, this was a process of exploration. And I think even on the dance of the Hebrew letters, he had an earlier version of Yud, which was not positioned that way. But then we, you know, but he always had the idea that these gestures would need to be natural. And then we were, to, we had a visitor, um, you know, prominent guy, I forget who he was, but it was somebody who used his hands to gesture as he talked. And when he was talking about the concept of himself, he went like this every single time. And I could just see Stanley's face like, a, oh, <laughs> wait a minute. You know, this is this is the right gesture for Yud. Um, and so, yes, Adele, that, that has proved a very fruitful association um, over the decades. I mean, this was like really early on where the gesture actually changed because of someone else's instinctive use of it in an appropriate way. And it's like, oh, because the yud is so small, you know, you could really, if you weren't pay, trying to pay attention to its deeper meaning, you know, you could kind of see it just about anywhere because it's, it's so small. It's a point, but, yeah. A but point. associated yeah. with what it means in an active and deep way, Oh, this is it. So that that was something that happened in hey, front let, of my let, eyes. Let's move on. Let's move okay. on. It's, uh, Adele, we could it's spend your the turn. Whole time talking about let this. Let me go ahead okay. and share the screen again. Yeah, I'm kind of curious about um, Ayan to Tav, whether that was in fact a mistake, and he meant to say Aleph to Tav, but he oh. said Ayan to Tav. Let's see what he let's, what he let's did. Take a look. Iron means eyes, and so I put blinders on my horse. I'm the horse. There's the iron sitting right here. Eyes, projection, sight line, sighting, iron. Pay means mouth. If you don't want to break your wrist, the only way you're going to see the pay is to put your hand to your mouth. Sadi means righteous, upright, clean, clean hands, upright. Kuf is a monkey. I'm dangling from a tree limb. Raish is my head, raised to project, raise. Sheen is to shine, and Tav is myself. Notice Tav is the opposite of Aleph. Uh, and and um, uh, yeah, that that was back. the last word of Boratius, of the first sentence. Right. So yeah, I think he. I think he. It was a clip of you know the these few letters. Right. And um, often and when I, I look wonder... at the letters, they go very fast. You know. Yeah. So it's nice to just see a few of them. I, I wonder why he didn't do Olive to um, uh, uh, Olive to Yud and then Yud to. Oh, well, yeah. let's be, go, yeah, yeah. go back. Um, hang on one second. <laughs> well, that's true. Who knows? In any case, um, <laughs> that that's why mm -hmm. that I into yeah. Tav. Um, he did um, that sequence a lot. There's not, not a lot to say about that, um, except those. It was just a cut from a longer film where he showed oh, all of the letters. Right, And exactly. so we're just seeing a little piece that it, that shows the beauty of these that was Yeah, that was from a video, and uh, I believe it was the first time he presented. Uh, no, it, it was the second time. It was uh, Alphabet in Our Hands, part two. Oh. Um, Okay, yeah. So that was the second time he presented the the letters, um, showing the meanings. I think um, most of those are still um, accurate in terms of yeah, what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, sometimes it's easier to take them in little pieces, and instead of listening to the whole thing going through all of the alphabet, and you're trying to remember this one and that one. And you say, all right, let's just take five letters. This is what the five letters are, yeah. six or seven letters. Yeah. And it, it, it helps me just watching that, uh, that clip a little bit and trying to remember them. I mean, Adele has been 
choreographing with them for for years so you know they're second nature to her it's like saying abc next time won't you sing with me so now, now we all want to be able to do it so uh, and, and he uses good he uses i in um a lot in terms of in, in several uh, examples as just showing the the how the uh the, the gesture corresponds with the meaning because that's an obvious one if you hold uh hold your hand up to your eyes there's a letter i in adele you had a comment unmute please yeah i was just thinking again about the um the extraordinary inside and outside sorry for the cars going by it's okay yeah so when you do for instance iron and it's at your eyes it's it's what you are taking in as well as what you're seeing out there and it's your insight and it's also um how you are perceiving your world and he I remember when he said, like, you can project this as far as you want or as high as you want, because the letter's the same as long as your eyes are meeting the, um, the hands in that. Yeah. You're also, yeah. you're holding binoculars, you know, if you, binoculars you want to see other, you're holding a set of binoculars right. right here and saying, how far can I see? But it also can be the blinders that the horse is you know, yes. in front of the horse, it's like, what are you not seeing? So I just feel like all of that is in iron. And um, it's just, you know, a really interesting like, a yeah. spiritual letter. And yeah. that and every letter has a different avenue toward understanding something extremely mm -hmm. deep or extremely simple, like right in front of you. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what I saw you know, in, in each letter, which I only because we've emphasized his um, how he said everything in the Torah is inside and outside and we'll continue to see that. And um, it's just a, a really simple way of seeing the beauty of the alphabet and how much each letter has a character. Mm -hmm. So different, every letter different from the next. And yet, based on what you just said, and going back to a previous program where we we saw Stan talking about the letter Beit and how that is so important to the research, and he even said it was some of the groundwork for the book itself, using that concept of inside and outside. Um, you know, interesting when uh, Michael, when you just held up your hand, that looks like something that you're teaching. Well, and I make an emphasis of the fact that using uh, Stan's expression, translingual puns, mm -hmm. that the word ayin for I, because that's what it means, is an I in. Mm -hmm. And taking what Adele said, it's also an I out. <laughs> um, but our physical eyes are one thing, and our inner eye, the third eye, the inner vision is the higher level of ayin and ayin and aleph because we started before with aleph um, ayin and aleph are unique because they have no sound without some kind of vowel attachment like a bet is b gimel is g d h okay there's no sound to aleph and there's no sound to ayin as a matter of fact in yiddish when they use hebrew letters to write Aleph is a, ah, and ayin is e. Eh. So if you see like an extra aleph or an ayin, you say, that's not how you spell it. Why is that there? Because they didn't use the vowels. They use a, ah, aleph for aleph, uh, for a, ah, ayin for e, eh, the vav for o or u, depending on, you know, how it was placed and so on. You were supposed to know that. So when you read some of the Yiddish names, if you're looking at a tombstone, um, you'll see, uh, you know, Yaakov is Yaakov, but Yankel, if he was known as Yankel, which is the Yiddish, you have an A, y Yud, Aleph for the A, Nun, Kuf, uh, Ayin for E, Lamed, Yankel. So you're using them as vowels. Mm -hmm. So they're not only what you see, but you're, it's what you hear. Like Shema is, you know, it should be an open ayin, the big ayin at the end of the word shema. So, yeah, it's uh, 
Letters are fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we could just spend all day just on this. Okay, so now I'm going to choose. Um, and I'm going to choose this one here, Torah and Pi. Let's see what he has to say about that. Let me say it. I think that if we get this right, if we can figure out what this natural unfoldment is and we keep track of it in the way that was intended, which is going to be the most compact and economical way, we are going to be able to show that the sequence of letters in the text of Genesis is just as determined as the sequence of digits in the decimal expansion for pi. That is a natural artifact of this universe at the level level. In fact, that quality is very similar to pi. After all, the text, you're not supposed to change a letter to be the destruction of the universe. If you changed any digit in pi, it wouldn't be pi. Same kind of thing. Who wrote pi? Did God write pi or man write pi? That pi is not written by God or man alone. Pi is determined by God, by nature, by reality. But it's written in our number system for our benefit. The pattern in, in, in the Bible, in, in the Torah, is a pattern of creation, not because some religious fanatic said so, but because, like pi, it is demonstrable from this reality and co-generates this reality. So that we ought to be able to unfurl the sequence of letters. Some pretty, pretty bold stuff there, I think. Yeah, and um, that was 1991. And he gradually stepped away from saying that so definitively, although his work was very much based on the order of the letters as they occur, I think at one point he, he felt basically that there was a certain point in the text um, beyond which um that might not be the that would not be the case and at that point was i think it's 2206 the introduction of the first psalmic um which is in the the uh four rivers that surround the garden of eden the auto the 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 sequence of letters and correlation of them is an aspect of the work that he gradually focused his focus elsewhere, um, which is not to say that what he did in the beginning was invalid, but just that there was only so far that he could, that we could go with it. Um, we did start some beginning work with an AI person um, trying to explore if there were statistically um, interesting patterns that happened further on, uh, but didn't come to any kind of conclusive, um, you know, conclusive uh, ideas about that. So as time went on, particularly as we got into the aughts, um, the, the emphasis of what we did was much more on the letters and on the hand. Um, and there was also um, at that particular time, 91, was the beginning of the explosion of, well, no, it was actually before people were talking about the codes in Torah business, um, which we very much disagreed with for a lot of mathematically obvious reasons. Um, so that, again, as I say, that's that's an aspect of the work that we did not really develop um, much beyond what you say there. Um, and, you know, as, it, as we learned a lot more about the text, um, came to see that how and how well it has been preserved is a matter to some degree of debate there are a few you know there are letter discrepancies of a minor nature between various uh, editions of the text and i think michael probably knows a lot more about that than i do um 
On the other hand, the idea of the utility and usefulness of pi as a lens, since it naturally occurs, it's a natural function of the relationship of the, uh, it's a natural function of, of, a, of circular things, certainly was a matter of observation to any intellectual of any period, you know, from obviously Euclid, ancient, you know, ancient times, etc. cetera. Um, what he did find in later years was that he st when he started actually looking at both traditional and um, more subtle, what they call gematria, which is dealing with the numerical values of the letters and numerical values of words. Each, each Hebrew letter has a traditional numerical value, which is not the base three value that we assign to it. Um, what he found was that if he started examining a word and then looked for natural functions, either, um, either ratios that might be contained within the relationship of the numerical values of the letters or functions of pi, pi squared, pi over two, then he would find really, um, very interesting and provocative and profound meanings to the particular gematrias that he was talking about. Um, so pi as, as an important lens um, was something that he came back to in the last decade of our work um, very strongly. Yeah, and I, I have a book of his of gematria that, you know, basically a, a someone who went through the went through Tanakh and, and just basically said, okay, the, these words have gematria of X, Y, Z. It's, 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 and the number of post-its in that book is like astounding because, <laughs> you know, he would find things and, and I've got, um, you know, three by five cards of his experimenting um, with various letters and words and so on uh mathematically dealing with you know if he, if he could find a ratio if he could find a function of pi and what would that mean if he did so that was the it's an important lens with which to view these things um yeah i just want to remind uh i think it was two episodes ag uh, ago when we showed the poster um uh and he was quoting a rabbi who had written uh, that uh, about the uh the the, uh, the sun and the earth and the, the measurement and that he multiplied the number times pi mm -hmm. and then it it came out to the same formula as the uh the slant on on the uh, inverted t triangle yeah that, that a lot of his more recent recent posters that if you look very closely at them you know yeah that looks like they've got a bunch of math on it and what he's dealing with is um is very often um in numerical quantities that are related to pi in some way um again uh, treating it as a natural and observable function of the reality the physical reality that we live in um that's why he always used to say that one thing that we as living creatures on this earth have in common with each other is that in fact we all live within geometry think about it oh yeah um, yeah we've we talked about that yeah three-dimensional world uh what about this idea of if you remove one letter from the Torah, it's the destruction of the universe. What about that, Michael? Yeah, it's well. If if there is a a fingerprint of each letter, before when Adele showed the the yud, I thought to myself, here it is with your hands at your heart, your essence, the spark of divinity in you, and if that spark radiated out your hand, 
since we each have at each fingerprint a different set of fingerprints, it's our unique way of our unique energy signature that relates to the world. It's like the colors that I'll put out won't be the colors that you put out it's going through the prism of the fingerprints. I heard an amazing story the other day of this boy who at 13 had some kind of accident, I think, and they had to his hip was so badly damaged that they had to remove his hip. Uh, I don't have the details of exactly what it was, but he was in a wheelchair. And uh, Jewish, but not especially involved. And years later, I don't remember how the thing went, but he came across an old mezuzah. And he had heard as he was starting to look into his own Jewishness. Um, he said, you're supposed to check these like every seven years. <clears throat> and so he took the mezuzah to a guy. He said, oh, no, it was his tefillin. I'm sorry, it was in, in his tefillin, had the Shema. And the same thing is the case with that. A mezuzah is not kosher if a letter is missing or rubbed out. That's why we use a, a metal hand to point to the letters when we read it. And somehow he found his old pair of tefillin, blew off the dust when he learned that he had to have it checked and took it to a sofer who said, I'm sorry, I, I can't, uh, this is not kosher. And he said, why not? And he showed him the Shema in there. And the word that was missing was uvelechtecha, when you walk by the way wow. in the Shema. And here was this guy in a wheelchair. Mm. And it didn't, his tefillin did not have the word and he walked or when you walk. Mm. Within a day or two of discovering this, he gets a call from the doctor who had done the hip thing that left him in a wheelchair and said, I'm very excited. There's a new surgical procedure. I think we can reconstruct your hip and you'll be able to walk again. And it was like one of those, you know, it was one of those wonderful stories where that like you get chills just hearing about the fact that this sofa had left out a word in the Shema and then he couldn't walk. And now they're fixing the tefillin and he got a new pair of tefillin with the corrected one. And then he hears from the doctor that it can be done. And it did. He's walking or getting ready for the surgery. I mean, it was like a now kind of thing. By the way, I'll tell you, I have two thoughts on the word pie. Okay, one is if you spell it in Hebrew, it's pay yud. And we've been talking about the yud. Pay is to speak in mouth. So we've been talking about the yud this whole time. And you didn't even know that you were fulfilling pie. The other part of me, who, if you know me, knows that I cannot cook, to correct the misimpression that you gave, uh, Levana, uh, in saying pi are squared, pi are not squared, pi are round, cake are squared, just so that you know the difference. That's the extent of my knowledge of pi. Oh, oh, oh there you go. <laughs> Sorry, from from the, from the sublime to the ridiculous. By the way, this idea of the destruction of the universe, if you remove one letter for our Christian friends, it's uh, enhanced in, I think it's the book of Matthew, where there's a quote from Jesus saying, not a jot or tittle shall be removed from the law. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And yeah. yet Christianity did change things. But yeah. that was the intention of his statement, presumably. That's right. Yeah. Uh, but yes, a Torah, if one letter is rubbed out, yeah. I That's have an cool. old Megillah, a beautiful Megillah Esther. And you read that on a scroll, just like you read the Torah. It's the only other scroll that we look at during the year. And it was my great grandfather's Megillah. And it's very obvious that stuff is rubbed out and so on, just from opening and closing and opening and closing and opening and closing in his day. And I took it to a sofa and he said, this is a family heirloom, but it's not fixable. Oh, it would sure. cost you a fortune to fix this because you'd have to do, you know, every third letter or something mm -hmm. to, to make it kosher again. So if letters are conduits for information, mm -hmm. if letters are gestures of meaning, you can understand that even if we don't know what the meaning is, that when a letter is out, mm -hmm it nullifies the good of the Torah. That's why you'll see in museums, Holocaust Torahs mm -hmm. that were, were burned or 
damaged by uh, you know water leaking beyond repair. And the reason that they don't repair them is that they're beyond the ability to fix the letters that are rubbed out. By the way, the other side of that statement is the Kabbalistic belief that God used the Torah to create the world. He, he looked through the Torah yeah. and created. He looked in the Torah and yes. Yeah. Adele, you had a comment. Yeah, it's actually that same mystical idea that the Torah is creation. And if you mess with one thing, it affects the interconnectedness of all things. So it becomes a metaphor. And wow, we need that lesson today as we've messed with mm -hmm. our environment and with species. And there's the wisdom, if we look for it, that was in our tradition, just that concept alone of the interconnectedness of every letter. Mm -hmm. And we are each a letter. So our own human interconnectedness, when um, anyone is rubbed out, anybody goes, it changes the world in some mm -hmm. way. So I, I think we can look to our wise tradition for what that all means. Well, we've each been able to garner a, a pretty good discussion out of these clips, which shows you the depth of this work. Um, one two minute statement from Stan gives us, you know, a, a lot of uh, fodder for discussion. Uh, so I would like to pick up on this next time, um, again, because I think this is a good exercise. Hopefully we'll have Daniel here and he'll be able to put his two cents. Um, and, uh, but we've used up our time for today and I thank you guys once again, and we will, uh, I want to tell a story, Bill. Okay. I told it in the class the other got night. It, it's right before Rosh Hashanah. Right. Okay. Well, people may not be and, watching this. Right before, but well, they might not be, but this is a game you can play anytime. Okay. A rabbi that I heard this from went into his, he was sitting in his study and it was noisy in his kid's playroom. And uh, he went in to see what was going on. And all the kids, I think the oldest was like seven or eight, uh, all the kids were playing Old McDonald, but each one had been assigned a sound, like this one when we, and on his arm he had a cow, E I E I O, and on this farm, and the, and the cow went, moo moo and that kid was moo and this kid was oink and this kid was nay and for the horse and the oldest kid said to him to the rabbi uh you want to be in old mcdonald's farm he said sure and he began to think i wonder what sound they're going to give me and they got on the farm they had a daddy e-i-e-i-o with a shh here and a shh there and this devastated him because he said, my God, is that how they see me? Is that my sound? Is that my expression in the world? You know, is that my letter? My, is that my gesture? He didn't say that, but I'm <laughs> saying it in our context. And then he thought, well, maybe it's all adults. They're always telling kids to be quiet. So he said, well, what about grandpa? Can you bring him into old McDonald's farm? And the kid said, sure. And on his farm, we had a grandpa, E-I-E-I-O with a hug, hug here and a kiss, kiss there, here a hug, there a hug, kiss, all everywhere a kiss, hug. And that devastated him even more because <laughs> it was just him that they picked out with the shush, shush. And that's how he was perceived. And so I asked the question, and this is something whenever, whether it's at Rosh Hashanah with kids or parents or friends, what would your kids for example, pick for your sound. What would your sound be? What would your gesture be? What would your letter of the olive bet be? How would you manifest in the world? And even more, what sound do you think should be for you or would be for you? And are you expressing that in the world as you go through life? Or will your kids simply hear the shh, shh and nothing else? So it's a very introspective, kind of question, but we're talking about expression um, and, and the letters and what is your gesture? Is your gesture this or this? You know, is it, I welcome you? Is it stop? Is it, don't go any further? Okay, or not now? You know, how do, how do we, how will we remember it? If we didn't have words on our tombstone, but we had only 
a little button you could push and it would give your sound, what would it be? So, so find that's the my Rosh Hashanah story. <laughs> find the letters and see what kind of gesture comes out of it. I know Stan did that in a number of, uh, number of yeah. Times. But it, it, it's a it's a good it's a good thing to yeah, think about. Good story. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we'll see you next time, and thank you once again. Um, and see you see you next time. Take care.